Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the uh, fourth and final lecture in the Hartford History Lecture Series. Uh, we also had a tour last week, which, which was a really great time being out at Spring Grove Cemetery and getting to tour Faith Congregational Church. And I want to thank the, the, the uh, History Committee and the people of Faith Congregational for opening up their doors and making us so welcome there. It was fascinating. Um, I want to let you know that all of the lectures uh, are available. Uh, they, they have been recorded. Uh, and, um, and thanks go to the technical crew of the Connecticut Democracy Center here, who've done a wonderful job with that. Uh, those recordings are available at the Old State House's YouTube channel. They're also available on Facebook uh, at the Old State House and also with Historic Hartford. And we will also be having those up of, uh, on the Hartford Heritage website at Connecticut, uh, at, uh, sorry, at Capital Community College. So you have lots of ways to, to access this great uh, information and great material from, from the fall 2021 series. Um, I do want to thank the Connecticut Democracy Center here at the Old State House. Uh, Sally Whipple and Rebecca and the whole staff have done a fabulous job. It was a really uh, war uh, a warm place, a welcoming place to be. And I want to thank uh, those who've come out for, for the lectures and also for those who have attended online and are attending now online. I want to thank our speakers, Fiona Vernal um, and Luke Williams will speak tonight, um, Bill Hosley and the members of uh, the History Committee at Faith Congregational. Um, I also would like to, to say that um, at Capital Community College, the Hartford Heritage Project is, is doing a lot of things to bring the history of Hartford to our students, and we also want to be a part of bringing, bringing the history of Hartford to the public as well. So we're, we're very happy to be involved in this, and I want to bring up my co-founder, the co-founder of this series, uh, Bill Hosley. Uh, he's the idea guy, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, he's going to introduce our speaker for tonight. Thank you, Jeff. And this, been, this has been our fourth year, and I think our best. It's really been uh, fun and interesting. I think we're taking this thing every year a little bit higher, and it's been a special delight to partner up the collaboration with the old, old State House and Capital Community. And the stuff I do is actually the way things, good things happen all the time. So I'm real happy about it. And uh, going forward into 2022, we are always looking for creative individuals able and willing to be presenters in this series. There are literally thousands of topics in social history, the history of art and architecture, cultural studies, political history, and more. This is the work of civic remembrance. Remembrance is, is about gratitude, and gratitude is the foundation, in my view, of a strong civic culture. And speaking of which, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Luke Williams, uh, who for 35 years uh, has been this devotion to the city and to Hartford High School is breathtaking. In the 41 years I've been here, I don't think I've known five people that have hit that this level of conviction and commitment and creativity. What he's done, and maybe some year, I don't know whether that ever, would ever let us, but it would be wonderful to have a public tour of the museum. There's a museum embedded in the center of Hartford High, and he created it, and it's been this labor of love for decades, uh, interacting with alumni groups and rounding up stuff and preserving stuff. It's one of the coolest museums in Hartford, and probably one or two people maybe in this room have ever seen it. So it's very, very cool. Uh, Luke has forgotten more about Hartford High than anyone else remembers. So let's see how it goes, Luke, and thank you so much for being with us. Good evening. Uh, I love being here because I grew up in the South Grain neighborhood. Um, by St. Peter's Church in the back there. So we'd walk up this way to go to Fox's and to the Old State House and the Athenaeum Museum and all that. So it's just wonderful to be inside and speaking to you. Um, I'm gonna try to time myself. <laughs> and I have this, it's not laryngitis, but it's a throat irritation. So I'm gonna be drinking water and sucking on menthol drops, which I detest, but they help.
Connections. Connections in history, connections in thoughts, connections in genealogy. Some are solid and logical. Some are illusory, far-fetched, even mysterious. The more I encounter them, the more I welcome them. In the twilight years of the last century, a series of editorials in the Hartford Current referred to the Hartford Public High School as, quote, Hartford's flagship school, unquote. However, the editorials were critical of the school for a number of reasons. It was at that time when I came across the saga of alumnus Arthur S. Hildebrand, class of 1906, Yale 1910, and Cornell, who was an author of works on gene geology. In 1924, he and his friends were lost at sea while attempting to sail the Viking train trail from Norway. Why these two things connected in my brain? <laughs> I can only ascribe to knowing too, too darn much. TMI. But anyway, it had something to do with ships, the Viking kind and the Hartford current kind. The maligned flagship school connected with the Viking craft. I thought I'd show you some pictures of the school, how it looks today, just to get a picture of where it is on Forest Street. Um, when the architects worked on it, they wanted to uh, use our owl, our 1883 brownstone owl, as a, as a model to put the um, owls on the, on the gables. So three of the gables have owls, replicas of the original. During, during the springtime, there's a lot of landscaping, much better than this now. They've been doing, the city's done a great job of landscaping. So these are the uh, pear trees in bloom. You probably recognize that, right? You probably, you, if you love history, you know that building. Oh, yes, it's in all the books and everybody's run it ragged. Yep, Thomas Hooker's house, which was on the corner of probably the north, yeah, the north east corner of Prospect. The, the plaque on City Hall there on the northwest corner says it was on that corner, but according to the old plans that I see of the city, the 1640 plan, it was on that other side. So that's where Art Street and Prospect Street cross there. And he, Hooker himself would have gone to First Church up Prospect Street, which was a trail to the church from his house. Um, The school began in his, in his house, according to tradition, and there were six other sites for the school before 1847. Two of them were in, uh, in, in houses and homes, and then some buildings were built for it too. So the Hartford Grammar School, which had this long history going back to Hooker, was the secondary school for young men in Hartford until 1847. In that year, School leaders, influenced by the ideas of Henry Barnard, himself a graduate of the Hartford Grammar School, decided to bring together the English course of the first district school and the classical course of the Hartford Grammar School and renamed the school the Hartford Public High School. It was also called the English and Classical High School. But the school was public in the sense that both men and women could enroll. The transition was a bold move preceded by much agitation but it made Hartford stand out as urbane, cosmopolitan, and progressive. Hartford Public High School graduates through the years were well prepared for college and achieved prominence and influence as adults, especially in the city of Hartford. Nationally at the time, many secondary schools were private schools, seminaries, and academies. Hartford had several schools for young women, one of which was the famous Hartford Female Seminary founded by Catherine Beecher. The trend was toward high schools and a broader curriculum. An example is Middletown High School, which started in 1840. What was this school like in the early years? The student body, the curriculum, and its governance? The answers to these questions are found in the records of the Hartford Public High School Museum and Archive, located in the school building on Forest Street neighbor to the Harriet Beecher Stowe Center in the Mark Twain House. Most of my information is derived from those records. We, we just have a wealth of material in there uh, that in spite of a, a great fire many years ago, uh, there must have been items saved in people's homes or the principal's home because we have records that 
are prior to that fire, which was in 1882. Besides Henry Barnard, a number of prominent Hartford citizens, including James N. Bunce, Amos Collins, Dr. Berger, D.F. Robinson, Horace Bushnell, and other members of the First School Society, encouraged the concept of a high school. The resolutions which they passed established a, quote, a free high school for the instruction in the higher branches of an English and the elementary branches of a classical education for all the male and female children of suitable age and acquirements in this society who wish to avail themselves of its advantages, advantages, quote, end quote. When the new school was dedicated on December 1st, 1847, dig dignitaries, and you can imagine, there were many of them. I mean, it would have bored you to death, I think, sitting there listening to this going on like that. And of course, Lydia Sigourney gave one of her hints. And we have the program from that event at the school. The school was located on the northwest corner of Asylum Street and Ann Street, a building of three stories. It had classrooms on the first and second floors with a function room on the third. You can see this is Asylum here, and then Ann Street would be over where that church steeple is there. And the sign over the door is Public High School. They, they, were, they were just, it was very important for them to have the word public in the name because it meant it was open to both, both genders. The students, I taught at the school for 35 years, the students would you'd say Hartford High, Hartford High, Hartford. I said, but you know the name is Hartford Public High School because, and public is there for that reason, that women were admitted, admitted, and that was the idea. So you must say, why don't you just say Hartford Public instead of Hartford High? Well, um, it worked. And I sometimes call the current when they print something and they refer to Hartford High School. And I say, will you please get the name straight? It's Hartford Public High School. Okay. There, are, there are other high schools around the country named Hartford High. Um, you, you can see here, they had a yard and in the back, I'm gonna show you another slide. Um, all, all the students entered from the main door and the boys went one way and the girls went another way because they went to separate floors. Okay. I forgot now who went on the second floor, who went on the first floor. Maybe the boys on the first floor because they would be the guardians of the school in case there were any riots or TikTok stuff, you know. <laughs> they used separate classrooms located on different floors. There were 286 applicants for the entrance exam. At the time, Hartford had about 15,000 inhabitants and 220 of the applicants were admitted. The cost of construction was about $12,000, okay? This building, of course, disappeared with time. It was torn down. And uh, Mamie White, who was a uh, executive principal, the first black English teacher at the school and a very dear friend of mine, had somehow, somebody had passed along one of the, it looked like one of the Ashlars, the, the foundation stones of, of the foundation. And I saw it at the school years ago, but then when they did renovations in 2004, it must have been in the, in the great court and it got buried underneath. And I never found, I dog, believe, I went out there digging. I could not find this thing. So it might still be there. Um, okay, I'm gonna go, here's a better, oops. That's a better architect's rendering of the school. They didn't have an architect. It was just designed by people in Hartford. I don't know who really designed it. So there's Asylum Street over there in the front and Ann Street over there to the right. And you see up at the top a ventilation system. It was a good furnace system and it was a nice warm school. Here in the, in the back, um, you can see a little outhouse and there was a fence between from the middle of the school going to the outhouse so that boys would go on one side and girls would go on the other side and there's a story there's always a story about jp goodwin who attended for two years and i got a lot to say about him he didn't graduate but he was loyal to the school throughout his life um, he and his cousin james goodwin of the goodwins of course <laughs> two rascals okay out at the fence 
Uh, now, I'm not sure which girls they were looking for. Either the girls from Hartford Public High School or the girls from Miss Draper's school, which was in the area. But they climbed, it was JP that climbed the tree <laughs> to get a view of the young ladies across the way. Okay, and this is all told in this wonderful um, biography written by Gene Strauss about, it's the latest one that came out about JP Morgan. It's just wonderful. This is our oldest report card. And believe me, it is a report card. Okay, it's hard, hard uh, texture. Um, this is the way they ta taught grade. They gave out grades up until the 1890s. Um, of course, the report card got bigger and bigger and bigger. But down in the middle column, if you, if you can see that well, there is a uh, about one fourth of the way up in the, in the middle column, there's a master, Benaja Plato. He was uh, African American. And he, he did quite well. His ranking is pretty good. Um, and became studied medicine in Boston. Um, it's the highest rank attained was 208. So there you can see a, a Wesson, Master C. H. Wesson. I'm sure that's of the Wesson uh, family, um, gun makers. And he, he's up there. And then the one over here is the lowest of the lowest rank, okay? I think it's a 69 or something like that, or 159. Anyway, this went out to all the parents. <laughs> so I always think, and this happened for years. And I mean, once I put everyone's grade from, from a particular slow class that annoyed me, all the grades of a quiz up on the board in chalk, okay? And I wrote in cursive and they said, I can't read in cursive. I said, would you? You know, here's a booklet on cursive, read it. <laughs> and this was public disgrace, I suppose. I did it, but it, I thought it would really get them to, you know, do a better job, but they didn't, they didn't change. They, I couldn't change them. <laughs> the schools in Hartford were regulated by a number of citizens on three different committees. There was a high school committee, the classical department of the high school, was also under the supervision of the trustees of the Hartford Grammar School. These trustees uh, went on for many years after the end of the grammar school and after they stopped teaching um, the classics at Hartford Public High School. Uh, they had a fund, the Hartford Grammar School Fund, and Har Hartford Grammar School trustees went on until the 1960s. Eunice Grork, if you know of her, was on that committee, you know, okay. Uh, and um, when they disbanded, th they had quite a lot of money, thousands of dollars, and it went to the Hartford Public Schools. It didn't go to Hartford Public High School because that was in the 60s when they were tearing, they tore, were tearing the old building down. There was a lot of strife in the city in the 68. So we lost out on that. I found out about that many years later. Like nobody ever said, hey, they have money down at the board of ed. So now it's, it's money that went, I think it went to the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving, I think, I don't know, I'm not sure. So it's money that's in that large fund for all the schools in Hartford. So in that way, it, it benefits the schools. Okay. The number of girls graduating from college was, was much smaller than the boys, as a large number of girls went to normal schools, which originally didn't give out diplomas. Degrees. Every boy in the classes, every boy in the classes of 1851, that's all from, from this school, 1851, 1854, 1856, and 1859 graduated from college. 80 to 90 percent of the boys from the classes of 1848, 1849, 52, and 67 graduated from college. The curriculum of the Hartford Public High School was rigorous, especially in the classical course, which was for college preparation. All students had to be at least 12 years old and members of the first class in the first department of a district school in Hartford. They had to be recommended. They, the schools didn't have names. It was District 1, District 2, District first District, 2nd District, and all that. They had to be recommended by the district school and had to pass an examination for admission. Uh, 
Hartford was proud of the 1847 building. It represented the latest in school design. But this mo modest, compact wood frame building was quickly outgrown. The city was really growing at that time. A larger neo-Gothic brick building was built on the Asylum Hill in 1869, and it was enlarged in 1877. You can see the main building, and then to the left in the back is the 1877 addition. It had that beautiful tower. It was designed by an architect named Gilbert. The tower had a, um, a lantern, which had a, um, it was a spacious land, it was circular, it had a telescope in there. So that's when they started teaching astronomy. It wasn't like the large telescope we got later. This was a smaller uh, floor model type of thing. And we have one like it in the museum because Mr. Walker, who ran the planetarium and the observatory in the 1960s and 70s, uh, it was his private collection. And his son, Stephen, is very faithful to the school and has donated a lot for the school. So, here, the, here was the school. It had a national reputation. Um, unfortunately, this beautiful building was destroyed by a spectacular fire in January 1882. Very little was salvaged from the fire. Oh, we have a photograph of the, the school in ruins and snow all over the place. But some of the records had been kept by the city and they're now in the archives of the Connecticut State Library. Uh, Duncan Yet Yetman, who was the first principal I worked under, when I started in September 1969, has his, he got his um, PhD from Yale and his thesis was the history of Hartford Public High School up to the Civil War. So that's a big source for us, okay? And we have copies at the school. I have a copy at home for reference. It's really a great book. Uh, so in spite of the set setback, uh, secondary education in Hartford continued. The students received classes in the Batterson building, good old Batterson, he was so helpful. He was on the school committee and, and building committees and all that. The Batterson building on Asylum Avenue, which was where kind of like up across the street from where that par ugly parking lot is there, you know, where the Statler Hilton used to be, you remember that? That parking lot, that gaping toothless part of Hartford right there at our forefront, the showplace of America with that beautiful Capitol building, we have a parking lot, but anyway. I'm ad-libbing here, it's too much. This is largely a lot of connections. C connections come in all the time. I went to one of the reunions of, what this was the class of 1968, and a, a lady there, one of the alumna, was the great-granddaughter of the custodian of this building. So she wrote a very wonderful, sh short piece, historical piece about his service, his lifetime, where he lived, his family, and about the fire, what he saw as possible, what was not the cause, because the current or the times said it was this and that. So he argued about that. He said there was no substitute uh, being on duty that night, so it, happened, didn't, it, wasn't not fi it wasn't noticed until it was too late. The, fire just, the, wa the walls were hollow, and the fire just leapt up through the brick and the wood. Okay? And it was winter, it was January. So where were the uh, fire engines? They were down at the wharfs on the, on the river, tending to a fire there. And I just picture, I always tell the kids, can you picture the fire wagon with its hoses and all coming up Asylum Hill by the train station and the horses slipping and sliding on that ice. So it didn't make it in time. It couldn't, couldn't save the building. Well, that would ordinarily push people down, but the Hartford spirit came, bounced right back. Talking a little bit more about the, the courses at this point. Uh, for the English course, there were still the two courses, English and classical. For the English courses, some of the subjects of study were bookkeeping, arithmetic, algebra, geometry, trigonometry, ancient and modern history, and English grammar and literature. Latin, French, or German were the choices for languages. There were electives such as astronomy, of course, because they had the telescope. And I'm sure they must have been able to see wonderful things because Hartford didn't have so many bright lights like now. And there they were on Asylum Hill. And this, so this was our first building on Asylum Hill. And the street in front um, became Hopkins Street, named after the Hopkins who donated money in the 1600s for a Latin school for Hartford. According to his will, signed in London, 
about 15 something, I can't remember what it was, or 1620, I can't remember. The classical course was the college prep course, and it was limited to 35 students in 1867 to 1869. Admission requirements were the same, but the subjects were mostly different, although there was some crossover. Subjects of study were Latin grammar, mm, Caesar, Cicero, Virgil, the Anabasis, the Iliad, history of Greece, and Rome, Greece and Rome, and mythology. I would have loved that. I would, would have just adored that, yeah. <laughs> I did not graduate from Hartford Public High School, so I'm talking as, still as an outsider, but not really an outsider with 50 years attachment to the place. <laughs> The graduating classes received diplomas and classes chose mottos. These were in Latin or Greek up to the class of 1939. The two mottos on the new facade of Hartford Public High School on Forest Street are esse quam videre, to be rather than to seem. I tell them, just think of that army uh, motto, be all you can be. You know? to be rather to seem is a little esoteric for them, but uh, if you explain it to them, they get the idea, the way you want to be seen, this is another way. And then the other one we picked up, oh, that, that one, that first one is actually on um, the original seal of Hartford Public High School, which is the seal of the city of Hartford, but with Hartford Public High School under it and the date 1847. The, the second model came in in the 1870s, it's on, book covers, uh, it's prefaces, and it's doke disque aut discede. Translated, and if you had Latin, you know, you can translate things so many different ways. Teach, learn, or depart. Now, the, the old timers, the old timers that I talk with, taught with, uh, and I gravitated toward the older people when I was a young teacher, because they had, they had history and attachment to Hartford and they were knowledgeable. Doki disque aut descedi, for them, they said, means lead, follow, or get out. <laughs> now, I gotta tell you something. We, without mentioning those translations, I went to a board of education meeting once when we were doing an accre accreditation and members of the, some members of the board of education came to the school and were sitting in the audience and all this. So the lady in charge of the accreditation program mentioned our, our two mottos. And when the second one was mentioned, this proper lady from the Board of Education was aghast. Can't they change that? Can't they change that? That's wrong, they can't do that. So it was explained to her, no, my dear, this is history. It's part, it goes, that, that goes back to England. It's a very old motto, goes back to Wickham, okay? And, and the free school, free school in, in England for poor boys. It makes me think that uh, Clarence Wickham, class of 1879, who was a great fan of the school, set up the Alumni Association. Since he was a Wickham, and this, there was the professor at, or maybe Archbishop, I can't remember who it was, Wickham in, in Wickham in England had that motto as, as a, a school motto. So I'm thinking maybe our Hartford Manchester Wickham, the park over there is named after this guy. Uh, pick that motto up from there. We'll never know. Correspondence is not kept from many, by many people. By 1871, there were 300 students enrolled, and there were three terms. Winter, January 3rd to April 22nd, 21st. Summer, May 15th to June 30th. September 6th to December 23rd. Although the two courses were still offered, students from outside Hartford had to enroll in the classical course. So if you came from Newington, and you took the trolley or the train to come to Hartford High or cross the bridge by buggy from Manchester, New East Hartford, you had to take the classical course. That said, you're, you're really serious about coming here, right? So there were trolleys and the railroad. Uh, I, I, knew of, I knew of a teacher, she was a relative of a, of a person I connected with at a reunion, all these connections from re reunions. I went to 71 reunions, so I met a lot of people about the school. Uh, his aunt was a teacher, she lived in Plainville, I think, and she took the train, I don't know how early, to New Britain, changed trains to Hartford. Of course, the train station was very close to Asylum Hill, so she just walked up the hill to teach and then reversed that at the end of the day to go home. I can't imagine somebody doing that. But in New York, you take subways, right? So, 
Although you can't go by a name, you, you, there are class photographs and surnames in the yearbooks after, after 1917 show a largely Anglo-American population. But there were African-Americans, for example, Benaja Plato that I spoke about, class of 1861, right at the start of the Civil War. James Webster Smith, class of 1870, who went on to West Point. Now, poor Webster, he has, he has a website, James Webster Smith. He graduated from Hartford Public, 1870, went on to West Point. Now, this is five years after the end of the Civil War. A lot of feelings in our country, strong feelings, resentment. He was treated miserably at West Point. And it's on his, some of his letters are on his website that you can read. It's, it's very sad how he was treated. He was court, they tried to court martial him. He was a very smart individual. And he wound up um, teaching school, I think it was in Maryland. So he had kind of a sad life. He didn't last long died in his 30s. The Chinese educational, oh, Ger uh, German surnames come in about this time. The Chinese educational mission, 1872 to 1881, brought 20 boy, 26 boys to Hartford Public High School. It was the largest group of boys in any of the New England schools that were part of that uh, Chinese educational mission. I'm sure you've read about that. that that's a very famous thing. Um, there were 26 boys, Chinese boys. There were nine Japanese at the same time. Now, I got in contact with a historian in Japan that works with Chinese-Japanese relations through history, because I wanted to find out if there were any letters or things with uh, how did our Japanese and Chinese students get along? <laughs> you know, they have totally different languages, but they were there at the same time. Well, the, the Japanese didn't stay too long because they went off to, um, as you might expect in that period of history, to the Naval Academy, to other types of technology, because Japan was interested in building up its army and navy. Okay. The Chinese students, for the most part, that attended Hartford Public and the whole Chinese mission, which was 130 boys, our, our 26 um, came mostly from the south of China. Um, One of the, I went to a seminar at Yale about the Chinese educational mission, and I actually met descendants of the boys that had gone to this program, the ones from Hartford Public High School. And there were interesting stories. I mean, I could go on forever about that, but uh, one interesting thing is um, one con contingent of boys were coming to Hartford. Now, to, leaving China, they left in a steamboat, and they went to Yokohama, Japan, and then from Yokohama, they went to San Francisco. Then they took the train to Springfield and the train down to Hartford. And sometimes they were greeted by families there because they, were, they didn't stay in dormitories, they stayed with host families. Well, this one particular uh, contingent happened to, when they went through I, a small town in Iowa, now I forget the name of it, it's in my notes. Um, the train was held up by robbers. So everyone had to get off the train. I think the engineer was shot um, the Chinese boys were all had on, on the ground, face down, and they were fearing for their lives because in, in China, their throats would be cut. So they rifled people's pockets and all that. It went on and on and on. And the boys came, came to Hartford eventually. And they found out later that the robber was none other than Jesse James. <laughs> now, um, Dave Smith, who was over at the Manchester Historical Society, I don't know what he was doing in this small town in Iowa last summer, but he, he happened to be there when the newspaper gave a, his, gave a history of the train robbery and mentions a lot more about the Chinese students than I ever saw before. So he gave me, uh, sent over a, news, the new, a copy of the newspaper that he picked up. He just happened to be in that town for, on the way through. And he's this thing, and he recognized the CEM right away. Besides, the, um, oh yeah, in 2002, a lot has been written about the Chinese educational mission. In 2002, I hosted a film crew from China Central Television in Beijing at the museum. They visited all the fine old schools where 120 boys total had attended. 
besides Hartford Public. There were New Britain High School, Bacon Academy, Williston Seminary, Hill House, Phillips Academy, Norwich Free Academy, Springfield High School, and others. A beautiful nostalgic commentary documentary called Boy Students was the result, and it was seen by millions in China. The Connecticut Historical Society and Hartford Public High School have copies. It's a video cassette, so I have to get those put onto, onto CD or some type of thing to be more permanent. Um, so I was seen by millions of people in China. And being the clutch that I am, I was showing in, in the video, I am showing some, the, some of the visitors from the, the TV, and I almost dropped the book, and I'm grasping for the book. So I think, did I do it with this group, or did I do it with another Chinese group? A guy came in independently, and he wanted to do a, a video uh, before this group came. It was suddenly Hartford Public High School and the schools of New England were very, very popular in China, interesting, with the communist government, for our first context with China, you know, in a, in a serious sense. Uh, the, the other one failed. I think he went bankrupt or something. So they were all called back. Only four graduated out of the 26. They were all called back. The Empress got wind of um, what was going on with this mission, and he was, she was fed ex exaggerations about from these um, rather hardliner uh, type of officials that would come through Hartford and visit and make comments. That, so out west in California with the railroads, the Chinese were very mistreated. That, that news went back to China, okay? Here, um, the, <laughs> the, the kids got into trouble. They were supposed to, when they came into their house, it was, their house was located in New Hartford, near Hartford Hospital, I can't remember the street. They had to bow before the picture of Confucius when they walked in the front door, when they came, to, came from school, when they went to school. They um, had the Manchu braid. One student cut it off. This is total defiance of authority. One became a Christian. I'm not, I'm not sure whether they were, these were Hartford High Boys. This was part of that group. Um, so it, it got to be you know, a problem, and that's why they called back, and the students were all called back to China, and they had to go back the way they came, and it's a very sad commentary about these, these what, they're 15, 16 years old, with wheelbarrows, with all their stuff, wheeling them through the streets of San Francisco to the ship, uh, and being people shaking fists at them and imprecations and everything else. It's horrible. But they loved Hartford. They, they were really loved here, and they remembered this, and they, families in China, the name Hartford, just pops up a whole series of family history, even to this day. So. Okay, I'm gonna move on with some pictures. That's Yong Wing. He is the founder of the Chinese Educational Mission. He went to Munson Academy and Yale, and uh, was a great force. His two sons, Morrison, and I can't remember the other, Yong, um, graduated from Hartford Public High School. There's a, a group, and they were young. They were like 12 years old when they came over. Okay, and we have pictures of them, a few pictures in their Mandarin dress. It's, it's really the cutest thing. Okay, I'm going to talk about her in a while. Um, maybe, maybe it's good to talk about her now. S Sophia Stevens was the English teacher in the 1847 school, and the students thought so much of her that an oil painting was done by Charles Noel Flack, and we have it in the archive of the museum. And I'll tell you why she um, was so loved in a bit. That's Joseph Hall. Um, he was the principal that brought the, the great telescope to the school. Uh, um, and I'm gonna read about that school right now. The school that followed the Great Fire was the famous school designed by architect George Keller. It was his greatest building erected in 1883 to 1884 on the Asylum Hill site at 39 Hopkins Street. The street's no longer there, of course. If you remember the chicken coop, okay, a block down from Hopkins Street would have been the chicken coop where you ate chicken with those little wooden forks that always broke. It was the best, yeah. <laughs> 
It was almost finished in the latter part of 1883. Can you imagine that the school burned down, the, the, the new building, it worked like crazy. But construction delays caused it to open in January 1884. Its facade on Hopkins Street faced downtown to the east to the south was the hill where the state capitol building was erected in 1879. This imposing school building was a school of, of the future, in a sense because it was a forerunner in terms of science facilities. It contained the famous 1885 Al Alvin Clark telescope, notably uh, you know, telescope and observatory, state-of-the-art science lab laboratories, and the remarkable gift of fossil collections, notably that of the famous dinosaur tracks, which were donated by James Goodwin Patterson. A large addition and second tower were added in 1897. That's the 1883 building. So you can see the clock tower with this, these wonderful um, iron fixtures up at the crests, up at the top. They disappeared early on. I think lightning took care of them. And you can see the other little tower has the observatory dome on the top where the telescope was housed. And the main entrance faced downtown, and that's Hopkins Street right there in the front. A, a large addition and second tower were added in 1897. Once again, Keller did the design in what he called the secular Gothic style. The school more than the school more than doubled in size with the addition of the Broad Street Building in 1914. You can see it in the back there. So it became, Hop, the old Hopkins was for college prep and Broad Street was for technical um, industrial subjects for careers in business and, and, and techno technology of the time. Um, it, the enrollment reached a maximum of 3,463 students. This was a huge building in 1939 to 1940. However, this beautiful old building was demolished in 1963 to make way for Interstate I-84. Now, a, a very big shame. We have photographs. If, if you go on the <coughs> Connecticut Digital Archive site, we have photos of the interiors of these buildings. And uh, you can, one of the pictures shows the highway advancing over to, you know where the Shelburne apartments are there? It's advancing, it's there that far, and the school's sitting right in the path. It's very sad <laughs> for people that love Hartford history. Well, when it came down, uh, they, they, actually they sold things. They sold paintings, they sold stuff. There's things in the slides that I have. I said, I never saw that, I never saw this. And chairs and desks. Uh, when they were selling it, the realtor had a lady, I think it was in the gymnasium of the old school, and People would come up, with, come up with a desk or with a sick picture or whatever. And um, one guy asked her, what about that chair you're sitting on? Is it for sale? And she jumps up and says, sure. <laughs> so obviously a lot was lost at that point in time. And it was done legally. The city was doing it. Then the state argued, hey, this is our property because that's where the highway is going. And we've already... Uh, got the property. So there was a feud about that. But in the meantime, we, we, meantime, we lost a lot of stuff, I'm sure. The, uh, the rubble of the bricks and the mortar and all that stuff was d dumped over across the river on the East Harvard side to, uh, infor to enforce the embank embankment, the river embankment there for the floods. So people told me years ago they would see, they could see things. There were pieces of this or cornice or something like that in the water. The increase of school population was due to the arrival of newcomers in Hartford. Jewish students started to come in the 1880s, along with Irish and French Canadians. By 1899 to 1900, enrollment had increased to 846 students. The waves of immigration to Hartford are reflected in the school's population. When I answered a research question for a lady of Russian Jewish extraction, we discovered that she had 14 members of her family that graduated from Hartford Public High School. Yeah, it was in the early 1900s. Yeah. Okay. I don't get nervous. <laughs> 
In college, I was taught to use note cards, you know, index cards, right? What happens when you drop the whole freaking bunch of note cards? It happened. <laughs> Jewish students started to come in the 1880s along with Irish and French Canadians. By 1899, enrollment had increased, okay? Um, it was off, the school was off to an impressive start, jumping back, because it was led by outstanding principals in the first 50 years. By the way, the original concept of principal was principal teacher, currently evident, certainly evident in the careers of the men who were appointed to that position. There was little interest for administration courses on the college level. Teaching and leading were different then. Their classical ministerial or scientific backgrounds and training taught them how to lead. Example, William Capron, principal of the Hartford Grammar School, continued as master of the grammar school when it became the classical department in the new building. He, he had studied in Yale, receiving the AB in 40, 1846 and the master's in 1849. After his tenure as the grammar school, he sailed off to India as a, for, to be a missionary in Manamadura, India, and remained there for the rest of his life. A few years ago, through connections to HPL, Harford Public Library, I met a young Indian lady who spoke Tamil, and she translated the letter of farewell that Mrs. Capron brought back from India in 1886. And so that's a document that I really treasure to have that at the school. This young lady said that uh, there are still two schools in that vicinity that rename, rename, retain the name Capron in their titles. The first, the first principal of the high school was Joshua Giddings of Providence, but he resigned after a few months due to illness. He was followed by Reverend Thomas K. Beecher, brother of Harriet Beecher Stowe, the guy who married Mark Twain and his wife, who served until 1850. He was quite a man. He was determined not to be like the stereotypically stern schoolmaster and instead maintained a kind and paternal style. He confided in the students, even allowing them to quote, sit in judgment upon various acts of misdemeanors day by day, unquote. Student court, we have some of those around these days. Beecher's style was controversial, as you might expect, but the students certainly liked him. In May 1865, Mr. Samuel Capron, brother of William, took charge of the school and served until his death. He was the teacher of astronomy and classics. This was a brilliant man. He was a well-known classical scholar and was very much admired by the school community. He had a large share in the planning and equipping of the 1883 building on Hopkins Street, which replaced the 1869 building that burned. Joseph H. Twitchell, you know him, minister at Asylum Hill Congregational, wrote of Capron in his book, Memorial of Samuel Capron, which we have a copy of in the museum. In our library at the school is this huge, heavy bronze plaque honoring Samuel Capron. Of course, it's all in Latin. An English teacher who was a great friend of Principal Samuel Capron left her own mark on the school. Margaret Blythe, teacher of English and literature, wrote the dedication ode at the opening of the first Hopkins Street School on January 4th, 1840. The ode is composed of seven stanzas of florid mid-19th century language but Margaret, Margaret's popularity was especially due to her direction of Much Ado About Nothing in 1869. Shakespeare's play has some language that was considered racy at the time, and this caused a sensation, whereby the students did not settle down for a couple of weeks after that production. <laughs> I can imagine. You know, the girls going to class with their big hoop skirts and... and you know. Her portrait in the school museum is a record of the esteem she enjoyed in her short tenure as teacher at Hartford Public High School. That was Charles Noel Flack. His studio was on the top floor of the Brown Thompson building. His, his portraits of the governors are all in the state library. Joseph Hall, uh, AM, 1860 Brown, AM, 65 Trinity, was teacher of physical science Sciences, Vice Principal, 1863 to 1874, and Principal, 1874 to 1893. In Hall's time, there were 13 faculty members and he worked to acquire the best possible science facilities for the school. He and Alvin Clark were natives of the town of Ashfield, Massachusetts. Their family lines were connected and they were both, of course, Mayflower descendants. Although we had not discovered any correspondence between the two men, it's safe to assume that they knew of each other either 
uh, and it, before either of them got together to provide a telescope for the school. I mean, they were right from that farmland and there was a one room school, et cetera. Alvin Clark destroyed all of his correspondence, which was very unfortunate because he built telescopes for institutions around the world. The school's Alvin Clark telescope was a huge and expensive undertaking. I, and once placed in the school's observatory, it was the pride, an excellent resource for the students and it was the pride of Hartford. A, a very high caliber tradition uh, brought, um, maintained faculty members that had a really excellent preparations before they came to the school. In the 1940 to 41 catalog, uh, the schools that teachers attended, are, some of them are Bowdoin, um, Wesleyan, Trinity, Columbia, Yale, Radcliffe, Amherst, Tufts, Smith, Wellesley, Mount Holyoke, even the shop work teacher, the shop work teacher, George Abbey, had an engineering degree from MIT and an art degree from Pratt Institute. That was the caliber of the people. And we have some of the things that he um, made in, in the museum. Graduates, how am I doing for time? Am I way over? What? I'm okay? Oh, okay. More, more. More? Oh, <laughs> I got more. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go fast, because I know it, it's hard sitting there. Um, eight, class of 1851, Dr. Edward Minor Gallaudet, Trinity 56, president of Gallaudet College, the College for Deaf in Washington, D.C. 1864 to 1911, he was the son of the founder of Heart of American School for the Deaf. Okay. 1862, Edgar Thaddeus Wells, Yale 64, chief clerk of the US Navy Department, director of several railroad companies, son of Gideon Wells, Lincoln Secretary of War. 1863, Sarah Glazier, Vassar 68, first female HPH grad to attend college and also first to become college professor. Bucktel and Vassar. 1865, Henry T. Terry, Yale, Professor of Law, Imperial University of Tokyo, 870, 1876 to 84, and 1895 to 1912. 1864, local boy made good, Charles E. Gross, Yale 69, Director of Many Corporations in Hartford, President of the Wadsworth Athenaeum. 1867, Charles Hopkins Clark, Yale 71, Editor of the Hartford Current for 21 years. 1870, Dr. William Henney, Yale 74, Mayor of Hartford, 1904 to 08. William Waldo Hyde, class of 1872, Mayor of Hartford, 1892 to 94. Henry Roberts, Yale 77, Governor of Connecticut, 1905 to 1907. That's our only governor. In that 1870 class, we had that brilliant actor and character, William Gillette, playwright, famous for his portrayal of Sherlock Holmes. His castle in East Haddam is a popular tourist spot. Okay, I went down there with a, um, what do they call it? Cabinet card copy of Gillette's graduation photo uh, from Hartford Public. They, they didn't have this at the Gillette Castle. So, and it's really, it's so much like him because he's got this swirl of hair like this, you know, because <laughs> he was a, a character. Uh, he was born actually in a farmhouse on Forest Street near where our, the driveway that goes to the back of the school today, there's some plantings there. That's where his farmhouse was, right there. Okay. 1874, Admiral Harry S. Knapp, KNA, U.S. Naval Academy, 78, commander of U.S. Naval Forces, Spanish American War, and all Naval Forces abroad in 1919. 1877, George P. McLean, state, state representative, senator, U.S. Senator, governor of Connecticut, 1901 to 1903. How many things are named after McLean? McLean Reserve, Reserve, Forest Reserve, and a lot of other things. 1878, big one in my mind, George Dudley Seymour, Seymour, George Washington University, class of 1880, author of works on American history and architecture, a great antiquarian, restored the Nathan Hill homestead. 1879, the Cheneys all went to Hartford Public High School, about six of them. Lewis, state representative, mayor of Hartford, 1912 to 1914. Then we get into the Chinese. Kai Ka Wong, Yale 83, 
held, he, did, he did go to college here, held government positions in the Republic of China. Sean Kitsai established Tianjin University in China. Mu Yu Chung, Yale 83, officer in Chinese legations all around Washington, D.C., and Madrid. I know his descendants. They're, they live in Toronto and Vancouver. One's a dentist. They're, they're just remarkable people with their family history. They grew up in Hong Kong and they always knew about their grandfather, uh, which ended Hartford Public. So the Hartford stories are very much in their family stories. And they're just wonderful people. We've been in contact for years. 1881, Gertrude O. Lewis, founder of the Connecticut Humane Society. 1885, Edward W. Hooker, mayor of Hartford, 1908 to 10. 1888, Amaza Day Chafee, art photography, captured centuries old ways of life in America and other countries. Okay, his house can be visited through the, Amer the Connecticut Landmarks um, organization. 1892, this one I love, Henry A. Perkins. Yale, 96. He grew up on Prospect Street. Then his mother, a widow, built a big mansion on Forest Street. So we actually have the, the number of our address for the school, 55 Forest Street, is where their house was. That was the address to their house. This incredibly nostalgic um, book written by Perkins' granddaughter. Um, I can't forget, it's something in the... Native and lady, lady in the house, or something. It's just beautiful. All about Perkins uh, and his activity here in Hartford. He was president of Trinity College, American School for the Deaf, 1913. You know, temporary acting president of Trinity, 1915 and 1919. The story. Uh, here's another connection here with things that we find out about. He was caught <laughs> with another student. Sneaking, sneaking back from the attic of this school. Now, I assume he was up in one of the towers where the clock was. They all wanted to know about that clock and the works, the clock works, right? So he, there was, he, they were going to class or somewhere and here was this tall ladder going up to the hatchway that goes to the attic. The two boys couldn't resist. So they went up there and oh boy, I looked around and we had this written in his words. I don't know how I got the letter, but it's, it's in the archive. Uh, and an administrator or somebody came by and removed the ladder. <laughs> it's an early TikTok stu brazen student a prank. It's just so, I, so eventually he would, they were written up, okay, for this misdemeanor, okay? Uh, he had never gotten a misdemeanor for anything, even being late to school, but, so he's kind of proud of that in, in the book, this granddaughter of his writes about that. Another mayor, Edward Smith, uh, 19, class of Yale, 97, 97. Francis P. Garvin graduated in 1893, Yale, 90, in 97. New York Law School law career appointed by President Wilson as president of the Chemical Foundation of New York. Oversaw German patents in World War I. Donated the Mabel Bradley Collection, the centerpiece of American collections at Yale. So that's a big one for us that love art. 1894, Maurice F. McAuliffe. Mount St. Mary's, 08, Roman Catholic, first Roman Catholic, Bishop of Hartford, 1934 to 44. 1895, Allison Patterson, first female grad, graduate in the Connecticut State Legislature, 1925 to 1929. William P. Maltby in 1897, went to Yale, Chief Justice of the Connecticut Supreme Court. 1898, Newton Brainerd, Yale 202, Mayor of Hartford. President of Case and Look, Lockwood and Brainerd Printers, which was, you know, a very popular printing company here in Hartford. The list includes many whom I have left out due to time and space. Without names, for the most part, I'll just mention there were officers in the Civil War, both North and South. Can you imagine if they met on the battlefield? Hey, you went to the pub. That's what the kids call it, the school, the pub. Today, renowned art artists. A great number of them, uh, professors at Yale and other colleges, pre presidents of colleges such as Clarence Barber, president of Brown University, presidents of large Hartford companies, judges on the state Supreme Courts and teacher grads who earned the lasting respect of their many students over long careers. I keep hearing stories from the old timers about Thomas J. Quirk and principal and other people. Yes, 
the, the Board of Education kind of had him ease out because he was in there for a long time. You did? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he was on the way to the South End. He was teaching. And yet, Ma took over. Yeah. After. Well, Mr. Um, Cork died. No, Mr. Taylor took over first. Oh, yeah, but then Duncan, Duncan, he was the vice Henry principal. Henry Taylor, yeah. yeah. It, was, it was sad. He died in front of the school that he spent his yeah. He was devoted yeah. to the school. It was, it was his soul. Yeah. 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 I never met him, but I've heard from graduates like Mr. Keogh sitting here <laughs> about Mr. Quirk. <laughs> J. Pierpont Morgan, fall semester 1848 to 1850, he transferred to the Cheshire Episcopal Academy and graduated from Boston English. In her biography of Morgan, Jean Strauss, a very good book to read, tells how he wrote a letter of protest to his teacher, Sophia Stevens, I showed you a picture of her a little while back, for his expulsion from class one day and how he was just, and for a silly reason, I think it was laughing in class or something, I can't remember. And but he, she also has in the book, Jean, how he was described by another Hartford Public High School student as, quote, full of animal life and spirits and not renowned as a scholar. <laughs> but he bailed out the federal government in 1907, right? And he was a firm supporter of our OWL annual, it was the first series of yearbooks that we had at the school uh, from 1896 up to 1916 a series of early class books. Uh, he, he, there's a um, commercial in the, in the yearbooks for donations when people are supporting it, and you have J.P. Morgan Company, uh, Wall Street, blah, blah, blah. It's in, it's in most of that, that series. Uh, Olivia and Clara, I'm still doing alumni, very, very quickly. Olivia and Clara, Clara Clemens, 1877-1889, of course, Mark Twain's daughters. We have their grades. <laughs> and they came over from the Mark Twain house to take out all the, to copy all the information that, from the books about the girls. And we did an ex, they did an exhibit, and I brought some pieces over to the, their museum for the exhibit. Otis Skinner, you might know his name, attended in 1872. He was not, these are not graduates here. Uh, contemporary of William Gillette, he was an actor on the American stage, pretty well known at, from that period of history. As years passed, the size of the school reached a maximum enrollment of 3,463 students. They needed another high school. Weaver High School opened in 1923, Buckley High School in 1926. So we never had 3,400 students after that. When I started in 1969, the enrollment was, uh, it was 20, 22. It was really overcrowded until they really redistricted so they could um, send this kids to the other school. All three high schools have undergone renovations and additions in the past 15 years. That's my favorite picture of Hartford Public High School. Take, isn't that beautiful? It looks like, you know, uh, the Acropolis of learning, you know? You can see the, the um, um, planetarium globe over there and the towers and I think some of the tenements that were on Hopkins Street, because there were, there were apartments all on Hopkins Street facing the school. So when you see the modern, there it is there. Yeah, you can see the backs. We have a beautiful watercolor that Alma Goldstein donated. It was done by an artist at the Hartford Art School. And it's this view. And you have laundry hanging from the windows. It, it looks like Paris, you know, Bohemian Paris when you look at this thing. It's just beautiful. It's a beautiful watercolor. This is, this, this is before they tore it down. And the, the tenements were right over here. And this empty land that's here. Of course, the, the crests are all gone. All the ironwork is gone at that point. This is the favorite entrance of the students. It's on the side of the school facing Farmington Avenue. That's the North Portico. And there's the owl again. This was his one second location when they were tearing the building down the teachers asked mr quirk to have the portico dismantled and then rebuilt in the forest street school in the courtyard or something like that well they tore it down with a sledgehammer so thank god we got the owl and underneath it was a coin because 
the sculptor, the, the masons that were, that was their custom, they were from Italy, and they put a coin under things. So we have some odd things in that museum, I'll tell you. So we have the owl, we have over the door, 18, 1638, 1847, 1883, those blocks in, in bad shape are in an architectural, architectural stones garden that I made in the courtyard. It's all overgrown with weeds, weeds, weeds and vines, but we hope to get some help from master gardeners to clean that up. And some of the, the um, just the capitals of the columns there we have in the museum. So that was, a, that, that is the book plate for the, the, the school has that um, uh, portico in black and white with, I think it's Essay Quam Videre, not the other one. Do you know where that is? It's on Farmington Avenue, uh, where the bus stop is, kind of like, yeah, where intersection of uh, Asylum, Albany, and Farmington Avenue. There it is. There. there you go. Will you be describing the caretaker? Oh, which caretaker? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, Richard, Richard J. Kinsella, yeah. I could just mention, um, this was all overgrown. The gravel wasn't there, but it, it had been really covered with weeds and vines and everything else. This is in the 60s, I think, right? And so Richard Kinsella went over with his hoe and his shears and everything, cleared it all off. And I said, wow, that sounds like he was an alumnus. I looked it up, he wasn't. But he had great devotion to the school for some reason. So they were going to build another school there about 15 years ago. And then I just talked to the architects. I said, don't touch that stone, please. That's, that's a very important part of Hartford history. So, so far, it's been left alone. I don't know what, it's a very strange site. You can't do too much there anyway. But they, they find ways of doing things, don't they? OK, that is Mr. Quirk's office in the Hopkins Street building. Um, it's his desk, the fireplace. We have one of the fireplaces in the, in the Forest Street building. Now, you see those pictures on the wall? I've never seen those. They must have been sold at, at that point where they were tearing up. The lamps, of course, were gas lamps originally. And the statue of Christopher Columbus there, poor, poor Christopher Columbus, that disappeared. I know it was a gift of the Italian American uh, Club in Hartford. Uh, it's a shame that his name is, is he's defamed so much. Um, but we all learned about discoveries. And we, with open minds, we know what the whole story is about Christopher Columbus and Spanish colonization, part of that black legend. Um, the only person that studied Latin American history <laughs> would know, I guess. This is a statue also done by Albert Entress. Albert Entrance Studio was in Hartford, a great German sculptor that came to Hartford to work for uh, the architect with uh, Keller. And this statue is named Adolescence. I have a copy of the bill for it in the school. And when they, they were careful about this one when they tore it down. It wound up in the school museum. Unfortunately, the little crown above it, which was typical Gothic architecture in the cathedrals where they you know, uh, did not survive. But he's in there, and I tell the students that he is, he represents you, and they say, that dude with the Roman clothes, he, what do you mean he's, I say, well, yes. He's got Roman sandals, he's got a shield, he's got his sword, but read the shield. It says 1897, that's the date of the addition to the school when the statue was over the main door. The owl, our mascot, and HPHS. I said, what does the shield stand for? It defends him. I said, yes, it stands for his education. And nobody can take it away from him. That's, that's his symbol of what education means to him. And he's showing it to the world. So it's a very beautiful thought. This, I love symbolism. And the Hispanic and African-American students pick up on symbolism like incredible things. I just find it very sensitive to that. <clears throat> so, let's see. Nope, I won't do that.
I'm not getting my paintings. There, oh, there it is. Okay, there's the owl as he was formerly on the forestry building. That's the best picture I have because he's inside now, but we don't have a spotlight on him. That's our George Washington. Okay, Inter interesting thing. We acquired this in 1915, and I identified it because of the, the, the cornices up in the corner, the little bracket type things. It is a replica of Gilbert Stewart's George Washington that was painted, the original, which is now in the old state house. Upstairs, yeah, in the Senate chamber, yeah. Um, there was kind of like musical chairs going on with this thing because there were many copies of this particular. I identified it by those corner brackets uh, because I, I have pictures of it here in the Senate chamber a long time ago. And it, it traveled to the old, the old state house. Yeah, it was, it was in the old state house for a while. The original was in the Capitol. And then from the old state house, um, when the new Capitol was built, the, the one in 1879, the old state house became no longer the property of the state of Connecticut. It was no longer capital. It was now property of the city of Hartford. So everything in it now belonged to Hartford and that included this painting. And it wound up to be stored at Hartford Public High School because in 1914, they built the Broad Street building, which had high ceilings. So it was behind Alma Goldstein's desk in, in the office of the Broad Street building. And then when they built Forest Street, he was in a stairwell in bright sunlight for 40 years. Yeah. So it, we were lucky to get it restored. It was restored by a great conservator, Ulrich Berkmeyer, who worked at the Wadsworth Athenaeum. It was restored in 2012, and it hangs over the fireplace in our beautiful library. So it's, it's quite... We're quite proud of it. Uh, and we have principles, photograph paintings of the principles around it. So when I bring the students to the museum, I, I talk about Mr. Capron and I say, oh, skip the guy, skip the guy over the fireplace. He was never principal. And then I go on. <laughs> anyway, I hope I didn't bore you. This flagship that I'm talking about did not, did not sink. <coughs> did not sink. Hartford Public High School continues on in a massive re renovated building completed in 2006, next door to the Harriet Beecher Stowe Center and in view from Mark Twain's pilot deck back porch. Oh my God, another ship. <laughs> so I know there must be questions. <laughs> Thank you. That was just wonderful. Thank you. Uh, you've piqued my interest. Is it possible to go visit this museum that is inside the high school? Yes. And how can I do that? Okay. Online, just um, <clears throat> key in Hartford Public High School Museum and Archive, and you're going to come up with the museum site. Okay. Um, it's open when I'm there. <laughs> So I can always make an appointment. I usually go in on Tuesday mornings, but I can change. sometimes I go in twice a week. It's been hard with the COVID thing. Even to get the students in the school to come visit, it's been very, very difficult to do that. But there is interest, uh, you know, with the, we've piqued their interest. And uh, they, they wonder, that there's glass, the windows up facing out to the corridor, so they pass by the classes there. And they look in and, what's that? And so I say, come in, but you have to have a pass from a teacher. Because otherwise, it's lunchtime and they don't go to the cafeteria, right? Bill? Yale, Trinity, Wesleyan, Smith College, they all have buildings older than the 1880s building, the high school building. Was it necessary to demolish it? If the highway went, my dad was a road contractor and he spoke 
vigorously about the corruption with the whole, he was, he was not hired to do any work. He built part of 91 and streets in West Harp and all that. Um, it got to be, if they, went, if they went too far south with the highway from coming across the river, it would knock out, um, you know, a lot of important buildings like the Capitol. If they went north, they'd knock out, you know, a major wealthy part of town. So the only recourse they had, they, they weren't thinking of a, like Washington has, a beltway at that time. The only was the school was an, it was an old school. The building was worn. It didn't have playing fields, so athletes, you know, had to go to Dillon Stadium to practice football and all that stuff. And it just was politically, there was a big protest from teachers about it. I have an article from the, the Times of the Current about how angry they were about it, this fine old school. But it was George Keller's fine, greatest work. Thank God that Loring Studios was commissioned to take photographs of it, because we do have, we do have those. We have four boxes. And like I said, they're on the Connecticut Digital Archive. Hi, good evening. Um, thank you so much. This was very interesting for those who never went to Harper H. We just call, we just call it Harper High, <laughs> um, class of 64 from the old school. And I just wanted, how many people here went to the old Harper High? Oh, cool. Right in front of you. Um, um, just a couple of notes. Um, it was the Hartford Latin School, and then they named it after Boston Latin School. That was kind of in between the grammar school name. I mean, the, the Hartford, the name it was in the beginning. Yeah, they called it, it was called by um, free school. Right, right. Latin yeah. school. It's Latin school. And yeah. then it became an academy in the early 1800s. Right. But then I, uh, in my research, I thought it was Hartford Latin School, taken kind of away from Boston Latin School because Hartford Latin uh, School was the second, Boston is the first. A public yeah, high well, school. They were also called the Hopkins School. New Haven still has its Hopkins. Hartford High was a Hopkins school for, I think Noah Webster went to Hartford High uh, when it was Hopkins, because he certainly didn't travel down to New Haven. Yeah. Um, but he, he just, he, he, he found, this is what, 17, whatever. He found the boys too raw, ruckus, too rowdy. rowdy. <laughs> and so he, he had a Reverend Nathan Perkins at First Church and was Hartford instruction, and the rest is history. But no, it was never, it was Hartford, it became Hartford Grammar School, 1810. Now, grammar school in the English sense of England is, is a secondary school. You know, we talked about in our generation, we talked about grammar schools being elementary schools. A grammar school for the English was a secondary school. So it's always been a secondary school, originally just for boys training for the ministry, and then later on opened up. Miss Room 41 that if you were in room 41, which was the tension hall, there were two auditoriums, and room 41 was the under auditorium, and they used it for detention hall. And every time the train went by on the tracks, the room would shake. <laughs> yeah. uh, and there were uh, two cafeterias. We had a boys' cafeteria at one end, and the girls' cafeteria at the other end, in the old Harvard High. And the last one, um, is there was a famous actor, very, 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 very famous. But when he married a young lady, um, Mary Phillips, uh, Ann, sorry, Ann Phillips, who lived with her mom on Hopkins Street, uh, she married uh, an actor who, he was a nobody when they got married there, but he became very famous. And I have a copy of the marriage certificate and does anybody know who it is? Humphrey Bogart. Oh, wow. So yeah. There's your little mini, mini history lesson. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Uh-oh, here it comes. <laughs> Easy one. I should know this, but I don't. The Chinese influence of students that came uh, to Hartford Public what was their grasp of the English language at the time they entered school? They had attended uh, in China uh, a missionary school. So they started learning English there. 
uh, when they went to when they were gathered and went to Shanghai, they were in Shanghai for months and they were, they were learning English there. Then they took the boat and rail trip to Hartford. These kids were in the uh, classical program. How the could they master Latin and Greek? The Anabasis, Caesar, Caesar is more elementary Latin. Uh, with their language difficulty, they, their grades, we have grade re records from that period. They're all eights and nines, which is, you know, 80s and 90s and the, the courses they took. They just, I, they probably figured, I got to make it here because home, home is a long way away, you know? Your back's to the wall. And besides, this was a great opportunity to be cho chosen to go to America and see an industrialized co uh, country. So some, a few died, they're buried in cemeteries here. Uh, with coal and New, New, is it New Hartford, I think one is buried. Yeah, so they, they were really well received uh, and the families um, were in correspondence with them for many, many years. But, uh, yeah. did I answer your question? What do you want me to say? <laughs> they, they just, they were just, I don't know. They, they were from middle-class families. They weren't of upper class, so they didn't have a high education. Of course, in China at that time, the only high education was Confucian, the Confucian classics. You had to memorize these things in order to be a government official. Books. I mean, that has its worth too, in terms of memory and language skills and all that stuff, but no technology or no, I don't think any grammar. They learned how to write, of course, with their character characters. And I suppose they knew the cursive style of Chinese, but it's, it, they were remarkable kids. They really were very dedicated. So I think that's all I can say about that. Yeah. Other than the letters that they wrote, you know, but they generally didn't talk about, from what I know, the letters, they don't talk about their teachers or the school per se. You know. It's more about, America and things like that. But in, the, in, the, in those families, there's a tradition that comes down by word of mouth in China, Vancouver, uh, where else? Toronto. Uh, I even, but I was emailed by a gentleman living in Sweden, second generation Swede, who's descended from one of the Chinese that attended the school. That's what I mean about connections. It's just, it's just wonderful. To, that, that's a thrill for me. Oh, I hit something here I didn't show you. Very quickly. There's the George Washington. We have a whole bunch of plaster casts. They were, they were done in the 1800s and the 1900s. The art classes wanted casts of historical or mythological figures for the kids to sketch. And so this is Octavian Augustus, okay? This is called African Girl. It's by a sculptor, I can't remember the French name, very well known. And I have these hanging up. There's the owl in his perch in the, in the new lobby. And that's the um, display room. We have the display room and we have the archive in the back. Archive is locked, I'm the only one with the key. And you see the plaster casts up there. And Mr. George Abbey made this clock. He was that shop teacher I spoke about. Panel, cherry wood panels from the old school uh, and desks from the old school. And they had a patent in 1883. So that right, right, let me show you. Right here, there's like a medallion, HPHS, the scroll thing uh, with the patent. And these were sold by the dozens when they tore the old building down. And I get, I get offers every once in a while because the grandkids don't want it. <laughs> Nobody wants it. And so I got one for the principal, I put it in the principal's office. There's one in the library, these two in the museum. Uh, I think Mark Twain House has one too. So yeah, we get those offers. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention.